and welcome back for another author interview here on Gimme Five Children and Young Adult Book and Author Reviews. I'm super excited for our guest today. Joining the show is middle grade to young adult author Chris Bowser, author of Pumpling Goblin, Goblins and Spirit Notes Fading. Hey, Chris, how are you today? Hello, I'm okay. <laughs> Wicked lives. <laughs> Good for you. So, Chris. I'm so excited to get to know more about you and your wonderful books and your pumpkin goblins. Now, I've always been a big Halloween fan, so it is so cool that there's a book out there with a Halloween theme. Can you tell us more about your pumpkin goblins? So it kind of came from some real life trickery. Uh, for a number of years, I had a second shift job and so I kind of was working every Halloween night, but I still wanted to do something Halloween-y. So for a few years, my partner and I kind of, we went to his mother's house and then my parents' house. We stole all their pumpkins, carved them into jack-o'-lanterns and roasted the seeds and just kind of put them back where we'd found them with a little note that the pumpkin goblins had done it. So and it was so like I, pumpkin jacking? <laughs> I guess, <laughs> but... But yeah, we just wrote this quick note, like, uh, here are your jack-o'-lanterns, sign the pumpkin goblins. And I thought, oh, pumpkin goblins. And I just immediately had this image in my head of, like, these little guys. And, you know, originally they'd ride around on a black dog and steal pumpkins and do whatever with them. That was uh -huh. the start of it. Oh, that is wonderful. So Goblin Oaks is the setting. Can you tell us a little bit about Goblin Oaks and the main character, Amber? Is she like you? in this book she's like me in some ways yeah um she's halloween hearted which is a term from the book you know that's for those of us who start thinking about halloween like when it's still june and like oh, it's going to be halloween anytime now um so she's a bit m like me with that and then the goblin oak is the source of all halloween in the world it's like this giant giant tree like it's big enough that there is a whole village around it and it's just got all these jack-o'-lanterns glowing in the branches. And so that's where all the Halloween in the world comes from. And these goblins have to go out into the world, steal pumpkins and bring them to the tree. It does, so when they steal the pumpkins and bring them to the tree, is that like keeping the tree source alive? Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. So which came first, would you say, the plot or the characters? characters characters okay so yeah. was amber well, I usually start with a, i usually start with like a setting or an idea and then i very quickly try to think like okay with this idea what kind of characters would be affected by that ah so you start with the characters and then just kind of develop problem situation solution like that yeah, I'm definitely a discovery writer. I don't like outline a whole book before I write it. You know, I might outline in small batches at a time, but not all at once. So what's the most difficult part about writing for you? Most difficult part of writing? Um, I mean, I think one of the most difficult parts is also one of the most important, which is just portraying character emotions authentically. I think that's something that takes a lot of thought and a lot of care. But it's oh, also, you know, that's the big payoff for making a good story. Oh, absolutely. So do a lot of the characters in your book portray people in your life? Um, not really. I mean, I'm sure if I thought about it, I could find connections with people I know, but I didn't consciously put anyone I know in the book. Ah, okay. You know, aside from maybe things I went through myself. Yeah. I know that a lot of my characters in my books tell my family out there they do have a lot of the quirks of certain family members and friends because i know them so well it's it makes it easier for me to be able to incorporate that into the storyline right yeah <laughs> so tell me chris i read up on you and are you still living in that old mill town haunted by spirits and the shadows of machine and industry i am still living in that mill town yep in and where in the Massachusetts? Ah, so yeah. do you do you think it's actually haunted by spirits? Is this something that you and your partner enjoy? It, I'd it? like to think it's haunted by spirits. I don't know. I guess I don't really believe in things like spirits and ghosts, but I really want them to exist. So, uh 
I don't know. It's like I can hold both ideas in my head at the same time. Like they exist and they don't. Yeah, to be a Pumpling Goblin author, you would need to maybe believe in those worlds. So when you create those worlds, how do you go about, how did you go about like creating the Goblin Oaks and, and worlds like that fantasy worlds? Do you have a method? I, I forget how the Goblin Oak itself came about. Um, some of the other things, I I did a map early on, like not a nice map, just kind of scribbled some stuff, some houses, like the neighborhood where Amber lives. I think originally a lot more of the book was going to take place in that neighborhood. But so one example is I drew kind of a scribble at one point. I don't know, like I drew something and I crossed it out. And then I drew Amber's map, her route through the woods. And I came across this scribbly thing and that became the Bramble Dark, which is the protector of the Goblin Oak. It's like this spirity shadow vine magic. That is so when so I was cool. doing this map, yeah, I found it and I just kind of labeled it like brambly shadow vine thing <laughs> and it made it in. <laughs> it was like so, the coolest part of the book to me. So the, you, you and your partner, you enjoy Halloween a lot, I'd imagine. Do you have a special way that you celebrate Halloween? We got married on Halloween, so that is when we celebrate our anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> and could you dress up? In costumes for your wedding or so we didn't but everyone else did we just wore like black kind of nice fits, but we told our friends and family go ahead and dress up so we had a lot of fun stuff uh, in our wedding party we had several doctor who's like the doctor from doctor who <laughs> we had doctors 9 10 and 11 those were some of our brothers wow that must have been a really fun wedding and did you know it what was, your yeah. <laughs> did you know what your guests were going to show up as no, except for um, people in the wedding party or maybe some friends who might have texted us. Like, we didn't. A lot of it was a surprise. That is so cool. So now, yeah. you must like haunted houses if we're thinking about Halloween and the goblin, the pumpkin, pumpkin goblin. Wow, well, I'm having a hard time saying that today. <laughs> so do you and your partner get dressed up and go to Halloween galas? Do they have that there in, in your neck of the woods? So I gotta say, I'm pretty lazy about costumes. Like the whole effort of putting together a costume, I'm not good about that. But you know, in this little town I live in, there are a lot of buildings that I kind of like to think of as being haunted. Like one of my regular walks up the street, there's this huge brown house with like pink trim. And I kind of think of it as Barbie's haunted house because it looks like it should be haunted. And right outside my window where I do my writing, there's an abandoned school building that's just kind of sitting there all dilapidated up on a hill. Ah, well, actually, that would be very inspirational for writing uh, those type of theme books, right? Just looking around at these buildings and wondering if the walls could talk and who lived there and what happened there, right? Yeah. I like that. Absolutely. So what would you say is your most interesting writing quirk? My most interesting writing quirk? Um... I think it might have to do with the order in which I write things because I haven't met anyone else who does this the way I do. So some writers will like start at the beginning, write all the way through, others skip around. I'm kind of in between where like I mostly write beginning to end, you know, maybe I'll be working on a sequence and I'll start at the end of the sequence and go to the beginning, but more or less I write chronologically. But within a scene itself, I don't write in order. Like I might write the scene ending first and then I'll do the middle, then the beginning or I'll just have a bunch of stuff. Like I'll have piles of notes and I have to like do the puzzle of putting them in chronological order. Yeah, I do that too. I have and like post-it notes no. that they kind of come to you and you just stick them here and there and that'll fit over here. And I do the same thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I've asked other people like, hey, do any of you write out of order inside a scene? And everyone else is like, no, I don't do that. That's, that's strange. I can't, I can't imagine. It's not like writing a, an essay, right? An educational essay where you, you need to start, you know, first, next, or finally last. It's creative. Therefore, it doesn't really have a structure. It's more of a flow. What, whatever you're inspired to write in that moment, for me anyways, um, kind of mm -hmm. sounds like maybe you're that way too as well. Yeah. And apparently readers like things in chronological order and to mm -hmm. make sense. So yeah have a good flow but 
I know that there's certain plots that some movie directors like Pulp Fiction, that movie, I couldn't tolerate it because they, they dumped around so much. So it's irritating for me for plots to start here, go from like the middle to the end, to the beginning, to the middle, to the middle. You know, it's like, ah, yeah. <laughs> I don't mind if they have a backstory, but at least let it flow a little bit. I don't know if that drives you crazy, too, to be able to read those type of things. Yeah, I tried that structure on my current project and it, it didn't end up working out. Like it came from a good place. There were good reasons. But when I read through the draft, it just, no, this is too confusing. <laughs> just a little bit of flashback. Yeah, a little bit of backstory is okay. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me, yeah, Chris. A spicy if... flashback. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tell me about your spirit notes fading. That's another book that you have. It's a short and it was dedicated to a friend of yours who likes short stories. Can you tell us about your book? Yes, yeah, so that was the first book I put out. And, um, you know, I had a handful of short stories lying around and I'd wanted to release something for a while. So I kind of put that together a few years ago. Um, currently that's available free for newsletter subscribers. I figured, you know, cause it's, it's been around a while. I'll use it for that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's not the same as, I guess, what I write in general. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, yeah, I have four things in it. Yeah, there's a flash fiction piece that I guess kind of verges into a horror story, but it's music related. It's called Banshee, and it's about a punk band with a real band slightly inspired by Susie and the Banshees, because I used to listen to them a lot when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, then it's got a reading that was actually read at my wedding, and that was because I'd been looking for wedding readings and I couldn't find anything I, I liked. So I said, well, I'm a writer. I'm going to write this myself. So that's the second piece. And then I have kind of an urban fantasy and then another one that's, I don't know, kind of under the sea, maybe a little bit steampunkish, but they live under the ocean and they're trying to escape and get out because it's a very oppressive, bad society down there. Oh no. <laughs> so they all yeah. have different themes, right? Yeah. Mm hmm I like Which, um, it. that's definitely made it fun when I've tried to like put it up on website and market that book uh -huh. like oh how do I sum this thing up <laughs> that is so cool though it's great I know a lot of people enjoy like this the novellas the short reads you know they don't want to dive into a, a 400 page book it's because chances are we're all so busy you might not get back to it for six months and you gotta start at the beginning again because you forgot half of everything right so the novellas yeah. are really cool so tell us chris do you have anything else in the works these days yep i'm working on another project called stars fall out and it's the first entry in a longer fantasy series it's kind of um sort of arcane punkish steampunkish and basically the main character is a failed printmaker who steals a magic vial. And this is after she and her sister both take a magical aptitude test for the very first magic native to their culture, their city. And so the sister passes, becomes the first student of this magic, but my main character fails. She ends up stealing this vial and you know, it's a very impetuous thing. There are consequences that happen because of it. So when are you anticipating, is this, is, this is book one in the series, is this correct? Kind of. Um, kind of. <laughs> so I wrote, well, I wrote the draft. It's over a thousand pages. So I'm in the process of splitting it into three books. So it's books one through three. Oh, wow. So how do you plan on finishing and releasing or how will you work that? Three and wow, you're very ambitious. So how is that going to, to follow? How's that going to unfold? <laughs> I'm not totally sure because I've never done this before, splitting a book like this. You know, I'm working to try to get that first one out by the end of the year, but I don't want to say definitely. But one thing that worked out pretty well is that, you know, when I got the idea of splitting it, I decided to just say, okay, I'm going to take the number of scenes in the book, divide it by three and see how that comes out. And it actually worked almost perfectly. Ah, well, that is good. You know, it, it turned out I had kind of a pretty good climax at the end of the second book. The first one is the one that needed more work at the end, but otherwise the split worked out pretty nicely. So what, what, um, age, uh, age group are we talking about for this, for this series? That's a series for adults. Um, mm -hmm. it's not like a very racy or very violent series for adults, you know, for the most part, it's pretty 
PG-13. There is one of those racier scenes, but yeah. I don't know that I could ever write racy scenes because like, maybe you either have to be a kind of a racy person or I have a big imagination of, of racy, but I don't have racy in my vocabulary. So my things are, are middle grade or pretty tame. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it was kind of a weird experience. I don't have a lot of racy scenes either, but I do have one in the sequel to Stars Fallout. And um, I actually read it out loud at my writer's group and I was very nervous, but I did survive that. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's good to do a reader loud like that then you can get some some responses and feedback on how they received it right yeah yeah well, i guess that's it went pretty well because i don't know it was a tough scene to write but that ended up translating into putting a lot of work into it and oh absolutely i know i've yeah. mentioned it before in, in some of the interviews we've done that um did you ever see the movie crash i don't think so it was a, a very controversial movie. The plot is, is a lot of racism and, and different cultural things that um, people struggle with. And nobody in Hollywood wanted to do the movie. Uh, Robert Moresco was one of the directors. And Sandra Bullock was one of the characters, uh, actresses that stood up and said, I'll do it because this needs to be said. So I went to Robert Moresco's workshop because I had writer's block at that point. And it's, so I asked him, you know, how do you move through writer's block? And he said, he says that you just have to stay up and go through the most difficult scenes. And those usually wind up to be your best scenes. And recently I'm writing the second book in my sequel of Tae Sung's Pe Peculiar Life. And um, he goes through a lot of tragedy and I cried as I was writing the scene and it was the most difficult scene, but I, I think I stayed up probably 12 hours and wrote that scene and just pushed on through it. And, you know, have you experienced that in your writing at all with your new series? Oh, definitely, yeah. The ones that are the most work where like every, se every sentence is like difficult. A lot of the times those are the ones that come out well. <laughs> Yeah. But then, of course, I'm also like a perfectionist, so sometimes every sentence is difficult just because I can't get out of my own head and, like, get the words down. So do you experience writer block uh, often, or is it mostly because you're blocking yourself, or you get, sometimes I just get bored with something I'm writing, and I was like, okay, if I'm getting bored, I know they're getting bored, so I'm going to stop and not write anymore until I find my creative side. Do you ever experience that? Yeah, I think for me, I have two types of writer's block. One of them is, I don't know what's happening in the story. And that's kind of the easier one, because I can usually brainstorm, like take a walk, and I usually figure it out that way. Mm -hmm. But then if it's an anxiety block, that's a little tougher. You kind of have, have to attack it a bit more and really find out where it's coming from. Yeah, I do. I find a lot of writers say that the, some of their books have sat on their shelf for years before they go back and revisit it and finally move past it and, and finish writing the book. And um, my first book I wrote when I was touring Europe for six months. And I just remember, you know, listening on it, read aloud in my Word document, listening to it. I was in Denmark and I was laying out in, in the garden and listening to the book. And I just got up and I started writing. It's like I knew where I had to go from here. And, and then published it while I was on the road in, in Denmark and Germany. But, you know, finding my inspiration to, to finish, but it did take six months. How long does it take you to write a book? I'm, I'm always interested. How long did it take you to write the pump, Pumpkin Goblins? Do you remember? Not really. Um, I know I put it down at least once in the middle and it was originally supposed to be an illustrated picture book, maybe 3000 words or something. Mm -hmm. And so it had a, a tough growing period, you know, growing pains because it ended up being about 50,000 words. Wow, that was a lot of growing <laughs> from 3,000 yeah. words to 50,000. Um, I felt bad because it was originally a collaboration with my friend Justin and you know he's an illustrator, but I, I kind of didn't keep to the word count because I didn't know how to do that at that time. <laughs> Wow, you know, and that's that's amazing to to put out a fifty thousand word book is quite an accomplishment. I mean, my little book is one hundred and fifty pages, and that was a lot for me. And part of those are illustrations, right? So, God bless you. That's great. So, how many pages is Pumpkin Goblins? How many? Um, I'm still working on releasing the print copy, but that should be, I think, two hundred forty-eight. 
Mm, okay, that's a good size. That's a decent size. Yeah. And the age group, what would you say the age group for the book is? So it was a middle grade book, but one thing I've kind of realized in the years since I wrote it is that it's maybe a, a book that I think adults would like better, like the kind of adult like me who still watches cartoons and not, not like really dramatic adult cartoons, you know, like, like one of those animes that's, you know, where they have the spiky hair and it's really dramatic, but just like kids cartoons. No, I'm the same way. I, I find that I'm, I watch more of the, the cartoons and the, the, uh, series that are put out for kids. Like I love boss baby. It's <laughs> like, I, I don't like adult stuff that much. If I do, I watch documentaries on nature or something, but there's too much violence and sex, drugs and rock and roll. And that's just not my thing. So I do gravitate more towards things that are, mm -hmm. you know, middle grade, high school. <laughs> so yeah, I'm glad to know some other adults out there who feel the same way. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say, I think stuff with a lot of shock value, it really kind of gets old quickly. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're just we so saturated watch, with it. Yeah. We do Saturday morning cartoons uh, with our kid every every Saturday. We have pancakes and cartoons, and we've been going through Teddy Ruxpin lately, ah. which I loved when I was a kid. It has surprisingly good world building. <laughs> Did I you know I said that. <laughs> yeah, they do. It's amazing, right? And I found out a fun fact the other day that, did you know that um, the original Mickey and Minnie Mouse uh, voice voices for those characters were husband and wife in real life? I did not know that. That's pretty cool, right? <laughs> oh, random they fact. Introduce, each, introduce themselves at parties, you know, like, oh, we're so-and-so. I'm Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse. <laughs> now, that would be a fun party to go to for sure. Speaking of that, Chris, if you could choose three people to invite for a dinner party, who would they be and why? Oh boy. <laughs> um, three people to invite for a dinner party. Do they have to be real people? No, of course not. Okay. <laughs> hmm. All right. Um, I'm not good at think of this, thinking of this kind of thing on the fly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> would you even invite one I of your characters from your book? Bring my partner. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll do that. Um, I'll bring my partner to him, and I get interested at parties, so I would like to be there with me. Um, characters. I'll bring Rory. He's from out. He's a power romancer, which is the the magic user in that world, and he's a very silly but also very dangerous person. And then how about George Washington? Because I don't know what he would think about sitting next to this magician, you know. <laughs> that I'm would be a twist. <laughs> yeah. Now, what, what do you think the conversation would be like between those characters? Oh, can I replace George Washington with Juan Pujol Garcia? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so I learned about him a few years ago. I read this book. I don't read a lot of like history stuff or stuff about World War II, but Juan Pujol Garcia was really interesting because he was this Spanish spy. He's a chick farmer and he offered, I don't know, he spied for the English and he just invented all these fake people and pretended to spy for the German. That he had or didn't have that. So I think he'd be a lot of fun. Oh, he would be a lot of fun. That would be an interesting dinner party. I, there would be no uh, shortage of conversation there for sure. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. So here's another random question for you. So if you could have only one season, which season would it be year round? I'd have to go with fall or winter. I guess probably fall. Yeah. Yeah, fall's a good time. There's I like no winter a lot, bugs. but you know, if we're, we're always winter, yeah, mm -hmm. no bugs, no snakes. I have a very bad snake phobia. You don't have to shovel <laughs> snow. I don't right. mind too much, but not if it's all year round. I don't think that's much good. Yeah, that's a true story. I think like um, living in Hawaii, I was only there for 30 days in Hawaii, and it was the same temperature was nice, but I couldn't imagine all year round being the same temperature. 
I like the change of seasons, right? You, just about the time you're, mm. you've had enough of summer and you're too hot. It's like, oh, thank goodness fall's here. And then you've had enough of winter and then spring's here. Oh, thank goodness. Which is almost here, by the way, which is good. Yeah. <laughs> so here we go, Chris. If you had to describe yourself in three words, what would they be? Oh, boy. <laughs> this is going to be another tough one for me. Um, it's hard to talk about yourself, too, isn't it? Three oh wonderful God, that's why adjectives. I write the things. <laughs> um, introverted, probably weird, creative. That's good. Yeah, we'll, we'll go with that. I think I could do worse. <laughs> and actually, um, introverted. So, all growing up, and even now, you've you've carried the introversion with you. Is that correct? Oh yeah. Yeah. So shy. Yeah. I, I was very I was introverted. Voted, um, most quiet kid, and I think eighth grade, my classmates voted me most quiet. I didn't really like that because quiet people don't want to have that kind of attention paid to them. Yeah. Yeah, <sighs> you're right. I, you yeah, know, my mother, like that too. I can relate to that, Chris. My mother was worried about me growing up that I was so shy. People would ask if I was in the room. So she entered me into a drama class and I had to be forced out of my shell. But innately, I'm a very introverted person. I prefer to uh, hide in my room and read a book or write them. And, and I prefer books and animals and plants over you know, being in a big crowd. So I, I totally and relate. I love this YouTube channel where you interview people. I know, right? But I love people. I do. I love people. And I love to talk to them and find out about their lives. It's so fascinating. But to be in big crowds and parties is, I don't know about you, but that just sounds like a nightmare to me. <laughs> that makes me very anxious. I can't do crowds. Mm -mm. Yeah. I can't do crowds. <laughs> I like to become the wall. One weird thing I realized I like a lot of uh, one weird thing I realized I like that pandemic. Random coffee. Oh, what was that last part, Chris? I kind of lost you there. No, oh, I just that froze. Um, I was just saying one thing I realized with the pandemic that I kind of missed was like just banter. You know, when you go out in the world and buy groceries or get a coffee, just sort of banter like at the checkout. Yeah, absolutely. That I can relate to that too. But living here in South Korea, um, I, I my Korean is is more like survival Korean, so it's not conversational, sadly. But you know, to be able to talk to a foreigner, and that's one of these things I really enjoy about the interviews, is that other than my students that I teach, I can have a good conversation and and humor and. I can use idioms and phrases and, and you get it, <laughs> you know, but yeah. I can't do that banter, you know, in and around. And all I can say is thank you and please. And, you know, the normal survival stuff. Mm -hmm. So you're right, Chris, that, that human contact is really important for sure. Mm -hmm. And at least we have our books to be able to engage us as well. Right. <laughs> yeah. So tell me now, Chris, there are a lot of young people out there who would like to be authors, and I always like our authors to share their advice or tips for any youths that are listening or watching, or their parents that have a, an aspiring author at home. Who? What words of advice would you give to a young person starting out or writing, or anyone starting out in writing? What would be some words of wisdom? I think I'd say question all writing advice. Um, because there are a lot of sayings that we kind of have in the writing community, like show, don't tell, never use adverbs. And I think most of them, they have like a kernel of truth or there's a reason why they exist. But on their own, they're usually missing some kind of context that you need to understand them. Mm, absolutely. You're right about that. And um, there is an author out there. And I don't know if you're familiar name, uh, Jessica. She's she started writing at 11 years old and God bless her. She wrote a 300 page book. And, you know, I feel that that is such an amazing thing, such a gift when I see a student that actually has an interest in writing that I always want to encourage them. It's like, hey, you know what? Write now and get your feelings out and, and create your imagination because the right brain 
in Korea doesn't get used that much. They're so busy studying academic topics, you know, math and science and these sort of things that when I ask my students, you know, what, what's your dream? What, you know, what, what do you want to be someday? And they're like, I don't know, <laughs> a doctor, a lawyer, whatever the parents want them to be. They have their creativity is is not there. So I'm always trying to get them into books and get their imagination going. And I think this is so important for our young people today. So books like yours, The Pumpkin Goblins, is so important for them to be able to get into these worlds that we don't see, but they might exist. You never know, right? <laughs> so Chris, any last final words that you would like to share with our watchers today about your books? Oh, I can't think of anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I didn't have anything prepared in mind or anything. So <laughs> the word is we're just I'm so glad that, that you joined me today and we we're able to learn more about you and your books. And Chris is going to give me all the details so that you can find her and her wonderful books and the new ones that are coming out maybe later on this year, we hope, right? At least one? We hope, yeah. We're I'm hoping on it, yeah. <laughs> it's a new year. We're early into March now. You've got time. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for coming on today. Good luck with those books. And everybody, check the details out in the description box below. And we'll see you back here next time on Give Me Five. Bye for now. Bye, Chris. Have a good night. <laughs> Bye.